So let's uh, let's do it, man. So guys, thank you for for joining us uh, for the third installment in this series that we're bringing you uh, essentially to educate you guys more and more about what we do and you know, specifically what what Anand does and what has what's taken for him to get to this point, you know, in, in his trading career, right? And uh, if you join us for the first, you know, for anyone who hasn't seen the first two webinars, it wasn't there for them, I'm going to give you a quick recap right here. Um, you know, number one, the first thing that we did is we talked about how our strategy of trading options, essentially like their stocks, is extremely different than how many professional options traders, you know, who manage funds and are a similar level to, to where we're at. You know, it's very, very different from, from how we do things, right? I'm not going to go as much into... Uh, much into depth on this on that one because the recording is there. It's on YouTube. It's it's um, you know just go to our Sandwichy YouTube channel. Tons of material there. That uh, that first webinar being uh, you know one of the, one of the most recent things we've loaded up there. The second webinar, which unfortunately we had a uh, technical error, um, screwed up the the audio recording on it. Don't worry, we're gonna we're gonna re-record for you guys. Get it out there. What we did is we interviewed um, Dave Griffin, who is one of Lucci's most successful students of all time. He, Lucci, he's, he was one of the first guys you, you started teaching back in like 2000, what is it, 11? Is that when you started teaching? Uh, yeah, yeah, two th end of 2010, maybe early 2011. Yeah, man, long time, long time. But in right. reality, his evolution, his learning curve was a lot less than me, you know, and I get a little jealous sometimes with these guys, to be honest. Like, uh, the shit I had to go through was far yeah. was absurd was absolutely absurd like to be a self-taught trader nowadays is extremely complicated yes absolutely I mean one of the things we say in a lot of the emails is you know our pain is your gain guys like we take the mistakes that we make and unlike a lot of people out there you know hide behind them and try and cover them up we just lay them out there for everybody to see and, and what we go through you guys get to learn from right so what we talked about with Nate is um, how is it that you've learned everything from Anon? I mean, you do. Um, you've learned from Anon, but you you apply it in such a different way, right? And Nate's personality, for those of you guys who weren't there, he's a very conservative guy. He's very quiet. He's very calm. You know, he's he, he's just a, a, an extremely low key guy. And part of his learning process was understanding that hey. Anon has a crazy understanding of the table, of options, of the markets, of the importance of trading psychology, and how all these things work. But his method, like his specific way of applying that knowledge, is not going to work for me, right? Because uh, you know he's too aggressive. I, I can't keep up with him. It's stressing me out. I can't do it. So we talked with Nate about how he was able to reshape, you know, the knowledge that Anon gave him and plug that into his personality. Out came, you know, a strategy that has allowed him to. He trades full time. He owns his own house, you know, with his girlfriend down in North Carolina. You know, the reason we haven't been able to re-record the webinar that quickly is because he's off fishing right now. You know, <laughs> he does that kind of stuff because he can't, uh, yeah. because he's a very successful trader. So, um, so that was number two. So that brings us to number three, right? And what we're going to talk about today is how what the markets used to be like, right, and what they're like now, and. You know, Anon is obviously going to do all, all, you know, almost all the talking here. What he's going to go into is, you know, some of the stereotypes you see in these old movies, like whatever Wall Street. You know, uh, what, what else? What else am I missing here? The, the boiler room. I mean, you got yeah, you got the boiler room. You got you got you got the Wolf of Wall Street, obviously being Wall the Street. recent one. Right. You know, right. you got the rogue, tra the rogue trader that happened in the late '80s. That was more focused in the foreign markets. Um, right. You know, there was a lot of other. Then you got all the documentaries. Then you got, you know, you you have uh, Margin Call. You have all the documentaries that popped up after the financial crisis happened. Right. right. Um, you know, so you got umpteen number, and then you got uh, our boy uh, James Allen Smith, James who Allen did, Smith. you know, who did uh, who did Floored uh, about right. all the pit traders out in Chicago. That right. was a whole nother world. Um, you know, so we have through through all the different periods, we've had you know all the documentaries that really showcase that because no movie, no director, and no writer, I think, can truly encompass Wall Street, I, especially now. 
There is no writer and no director that can do this. I think you and I are going to have to do this. At some point. We're going to have to do this for the world. We're really going to have to do this because nobody can do this. I've been taking notes for, for the last few years, man. I, I didn't spend the first you know, three years of my career yeah. in uh, screenwriting for no reason. I'll tell you that yeah. much. Um, so, so, guys, what, what we're getting at is a lot of those movies and stuff, they're based on the culture of it was easy for a lot of guys to make money. Right? It, was, it was easier to make money. And that stuff, a lot of that is based in truth. Like, we all know traders who are older, who, who were trading in the 80s, they're trading in the 90s, and some of them are trading now, some of them have moved on. Right? We're going to talk about that, too, because they'll tell you, they'll be the first ones to tell you, it's a lot harder now to make money than it was back then. There's much more competition in the markets. The competition's smarter. The edge is just not there as much. And I think one of the things that we look at, one of the reasons that we, you know, live in the option space because we really feel like that edge is there, right? So Luch, let's start out, you know, you can jump into, um, you know, what was the world, what's sort of like the world of like yesteryear, right? And like how did we, yeah. you, know, you know, want a quick run out of like from pit traders to, you know, decimalization, how did we get to where we are? Yeah, so for all you guys that, you know, that are, are sort of fairly new, and again, you know, Charlie and I, and, and, and more myself, I mean, we're fairly new to this game too. I mean, I came in in 2006. You know, I came in in 2006, way after the tech crash, way after the tech boom, the initial boom that 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 spurred the crash, right? Way after the crash of 2001, after we, you know the World Trade hit, um, you know, way after the depression in the 80s, I believe it was. I think it was early 80s that 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 it was. Then the bull market of the 90s. You know, 87. Right. Huge, yeah. Right, exactly. So all of these sort of boom and bust cycles have happened and spurred uh, sort of the capitalistic environment that is the stock market. Remember, you're in an environment where all the players, the complexity of the players, the knowledge of the players, uh, the environment uh, that we're in currently, the economic environment that we're in, the global <sighs> environment that we're in, all of this stuff shapes the changes that happen in the market. And through all of these different cycles, somebody wins and somebody loses. So there is a group of people that no longer can make money. And it breeds the new, it, it just cultivates and breeds the new trader. So the retail guy from, let's say, 20 years ago, uh, where literally they would just buy, they would just buy a stock, sit on it for five years, that was the strategy, right? There was no day traders really before that. And if we go through a quick like, you know, past sort of experience here, retail traders didn't even exist until sort of the beginning of the 80s, right? And even when they did exist, it, they didn't have the access, right? They couldn't even see uh, uh, the electronic markets that you and I see every single day. So right. you and I will sit there, pop open this level two, take a look at a spy chart and be like, okay, my bid is 194.80. My offer is 194.82. Back in the 80s, you couldn't get shit like this. You couldn't get. You had to call your broker who needed to have access to an exchange. All right, and it was open outcry. All right, and what open outcry means is that people would yell their bids and offers, and unless you had access to that, you didn't know where the market was, so you didn't know where to buy and sell. Because you didn't know this, you needed a broker. So you needed to call your broker and say, yo, I want to buy this or I want to sell this. And it was your broker's duty to figure out the best price here. All right? You would rely on your broker. Right. Okay? And this was throughout you know, the 80s and, and the sophistication started to happen. Electronic uh, markets started to happen. You, know, you had your E-Trades pop up. You had your Scott Trades pop up. That way you could get access to what the market was. But even then... There was still such a, uh, a sort of fragmented uh, uh, viewpoint of what the real market was and then what retail people saw on their E-Trade uh, machines and, and their Bloomberg platforms, right? Because they didn't have access to all these different exchanges and all the different brokers out there that sort of provided the, the best bid and best offer, okay? So we had a situation where... Um, Fraction, fractions became decimals, so it's important to talk about spreads when your father was around, uh, you know, when your pops was around back in his heyday. Yep. And you could be a market maker for a stock like a Microsoft or an Apple or whatever it was, and the spreads were so wide 
that so, being a market maker was just it was just golden because you would just get oh. dumb money everywhere and you could make money clean and easy everywhere and and that was really the mo it was like a golden profession or something i mean it really you really did obviously there were events that would come into the market and sort of change things and rattle people's cages but like consistently if you were a market maker and you had you know the right capitalization the right firm with spreads the way they were it was extremely difficult difficult to lose money like you had to really try to lose money whereas right, right. now i mean that's not the case anymore that's not the case. right right and the game exactly and having a floor and we had a we, we just had a comment here from dave cole about specialist seats on the nice i mean being a, having a seat on an exchange used to mean something it used to mean that you were privy to information that nobody else could get and nobody else could get about the market and where it was at the at that moment for any specific equity that you wanted to trade okay then we have a situation let's fast forward this through all the booms and busts and everything fast forward this to where we are now in 2007 2007 was when regulations changed in the marketplace and open the doors to computerized trading and algorithms. So now you have a situation where the race on those spreads, and obviously the decimalization of the market, right? So now you don't have fraction spreads anymore, one eighth, one fourth, and one half spreads. You don't have any of that. Now you have decimalization. So where you take a look at a, a, a spy, for example, you got one cent spreads. You look at Bank of America, you got one cent spreads. Uh, you know. So now we have a situation where spreads are being sort of minimized. You have a situation where uh, retail traders and access to information is now readily available by anyone and everyone who wants it. Good information too, right? You have the complexity of the individuals that are trading is now far beyond reach. Wait. So you have a capitalist environment where now everybody is a fucking genius. Access to information is readily available. And that means all the edges and all the spreads in the market are being squeezed down to nothing, to literally nothing. So any edge that used to exist before about unbelievable spreads or maybe a, a, a sort of arbitrage situation in the marketplace, those do not exist anymore. And if they do, they exist on a very sort of infinitesimal, if, is that the right word, infinitesimal level? Yeah. Infinitesimal oh. level. Right, where only certain people are able to capitalize on that. Okay, right. so so that's the situation that we are now. So if we talk about though the players that sort of got lopped off, uh, you know, all the way in, we're talking about specialists on the floor. We're talking about open outcry pit traders. We're talking about hedge fund traders that were used to a certain model of making money that just doesn't make any money anymore. Um, and we're talking about a new breed of electronic algo traders and retail traders who have been able to adapt consistently. There always is a retail trader. There will always be a retail trader. But this guy has got to be, he's got to be, look at the market and see where he belongs and see where the money is uh, and work more on, on, the, on the mental level. And that's the guy that continues to adapt I mean, and, and, and keep going. And arguably, based on what you just said, the retail trader has a better shot than ever in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, we do talk a lot about how HFT and and a lot of predators out there, you know, attack and skim off of uh, retail order flow. And and you know, guys, you want if you're curious about what's going on in the retail world, just go to this section of our site it's called Trading Machines. You know, there's a lot of explanation on there about what goes on behind the scenes. But that is, you know, the the amount to which the retail trader has been gets taken advantage of on a daily basis has actually been reduced very significantly, you know, as, as time has gone on, right? The, the, the tools that used to only be available to, you know, um, and the tools and the information, exactly what Luigi said, that used to only be available to, you know, certain classes of market participants are now basically, you know, it, it's not a completely even playing field, but it's a lot closer. To the Absolutely. Market, right? Absolutely. But then it comes down to, it, it comes down to, well, if you're not making money, then it's, it's either a problem with the instruments that you're trading, right, or how you're trading them, right? right. There's, there isn't as much, you know, excuse anymore for a retail trader who's getting crushed all the time, you know? Right. So let's talk about a little bit about um, options in, in that. Sure. Case. How options factor into this, right? Because right. we talked a little bit about options and how they are 
you know, kind of going with this whole cowboy theme sometimes. It's almost like they're the last, you know, the, the, still the, the wild, wild west, still the place where edge can be found, right? Where spreads right. exist and where you can right. make that money. You used to hear about people making it in the 90s and stuff. Talk right. About Right. So, uh, uh, you know, everybody is asking, so where the hell is the edge right now? I mean, where the hell is the edge? Um, and, that's the, and that's the thing right now with retail traders. I mean, you know, the edge is really sort of squeezed down to a much smaller time frame. And the sort of understanding of when this big picture alpha is going to happen that retail can actually make money off of, um, you know, is squeezed down to a much smaller time frame. This means that you need to be able to process the information a lot quicker than you would before 2007, before the markets became electronic and the computers basically took over. So you need to be able to process the information quicker, and you need to be able to move a lot quicker as well. Right. Okay. Now, what options are allowing people to do and have allowed people to do is to basically build strategies that that can make money in a lot more types of environments than, let's say, a, a, a regular equities trader, right? Like a regular equities trader has to just buy and sell and has to play a direction, generally speaking. They, they, this, is, this is generally what they have to do. This is if you trade equities. You need to make money on a stock if it goes up, and you need to make money on a stock if it goes down. Options traders, they can make money on a stock when it does nothing. They can also make money on a stock when it's, when it's sort of in consolidation. Uh, you know, and and again, you know, equities guys can do it too, but they got to be right on that direction. They always have to be right on that direction. Options traders can go with more sort of complex strategies to help mitigate a lot more of the directional risk, and that's what most options traders trade. That's how most options traders, expert in sort of you know guys like Brian Weiner, uh, uh, guys that we've come across that now work at some of these big banks. You know, they trade with minimal risk. So that means if they put on a directional position, they hedge themselves out completely so they're essentially taking no risk on the trade. That's what most of the algo options traders do, the HFT options traders do, uh, you know, and some of the more professional sort of options traders. Now, guys like myself, retail guys who are still going for large moves in the markets, remember, large moves in the markets happen all the time. I mean, Apple ripped 50 points in the last month. You got a 100-point move on Chipotle in about two weeks. So there's no shortage of alpha in the market. Right. There's just a difference on how you process the information and how quickly you move and right. how you read all the players involved. Since everybody's getting smarter, it's much easier to move the perception of retail than it was before. Than it was before you know? So market makers, algos, uh, you know, predatory algos, I should say, uh, you know, they're all interested in understanding this behavioral aspect so they can make the retail trader, they can, they can put the retail trader at a disadvantage. Right. So their edge, their edge is essentially taking advantage of the retail mindset and the retail behavior. That's what their real edge now is in the marketplace. You know, and it's a huge edge. It's a big edge. Totally, totally. And, you know, we talk a lot and a lot about what this, what this is about is, you know, the continuous need to constantly evolve and reinvent yourself and adjust your strategies to a changing market, right? I mean, that's a core part of what we teach and, you know, are always preaching about. If you are relegated to and confined to a certain set of the strategies that are offered by only trading equities, right? I mean, you can adjust, I get you the long or short, right? And you can, you know, adjust your size a little bit, but there's only so much that you can do within the confines of equities. Right, options allow you such a more diverse sort of palette of trading tools, right? Of methodologies that you can use. I mean, how many various ways are there to to go along a move via options, right? I mean, there's there's I'm sure Brian could could talk about 50 different ways that you can actually accomplish that, right? Right, right. There's synthetic, and, and in the world of options, there's synthetic long, there's, 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 there's so many, like, minutia details right. on all these different types of strategies that you can use with options. The point is, is that in the option space, the spreads are still wide, so there's plenty of game, there's plenty of game for all parties, all right? Uh, much more than the, much more than the equity side. 
and with options you you can define your risk you can really work with with more complicated strategies to mitigate a lot of that risk that you take now I'm not in the business of mitigating my risk I'm in the business of being risky that's what I'm in the business of however for newer traders that come along and let's say learn from me they've been they've had to adapt to this environment remember a trader who goes through several different environments has a much more difficult time adapting to the new environment adapting to the new money why because he's stuck on the old stuff he's stuck when times were good he's still thinking about 2009 when he made you know four million bucks he's still thinking about the tech crash well, he shorted Microsoft from $300 and covered it at 25 bucks. That's what he's talking about. And by the way, any broker that you talk to now or any pitch trader that you talk to now, guess what they do? They're in the brokerage business. They're in the business of selling you guys the dream. That's what they're in the business of. Plus the name is Brian Weiner. Unless, uh, right, right, exactly. So you have traders who either have to adapt to the game or they say, you know what, there's no edge anymore. And by the way, that's what they all say. All the pitch traders, uh, uh, you know, from, from Chicago, uh, uh, you know, from New York, none of these guys exist anymore. And they went to the brokerage side of the business. All they went to was executing trades for mutual funds, for hedge funds, and things like that. Or selling bullshit financial products and crap that, you know, they just can make an easy ripoff of. Because the game is about rips. The game now is about rips and making commissions. Because nobody believes that you can successfully derive that alpha from the markets on a consistent basis anymore. Right. Because nobody has been able to stand that test of time. So why do we think we're any different? I mean, that's really the question. That is really the question. So, so I, the answer to that question is that there is a group of people that constantly can adapt. There are algo guys now, uh, you know, that constantly can tweak their algorithms. Uh, you know, retail guys like myself, we can constantly reinvent ourselves. There's no ceiling that we hit where we just say, oh, yeah, we got to give up here. There's no more money here. There's money here all the time. You just got to adapt to, to processing that information uh, and, and going where that money flow is and changing your strategy to where that money flow is. And that's, and that's, and that's all we preach. Right, right. And, you know, you said you kind of put yourself there as, as retail. I mean, the way when we say, you know, when you say you're retail, I mean, you're saying coming from the background of not some, you know, crazy ass. When you walked in, you learned trading via your own experience, via your own mistakes. You didn't have some mentor right. sit down and no. say, you know, and, and you absolutely learn. No one learns in a vacuum. No one learns on their own, right? Yeah, no. no one continues to evolve on completely on their own. But you weren't coming in, you know, you weren't hired in, in a professional environment saying, okay, right. now we're going to teach you X, Y, Z, right? And so, right. you know, I think that's one of the reasons that our, what we offer as a company is so unique in that we do have all these guys, you know, Brian and Ryan and Ezra and, and whatnot who are, you know, have been at the very, very top of, of the industry in the most elite firms. Um, but... They're also partnered up with with you, you know, from a training perspective, and you understand what the retail perspective is because you used to be that guy, you know, yeah. you know yeah. before you started everything and launched everything. So, um, you know, and I, and I think, guys, in part of what we're communicating, and if you guys got questions, keep on launching them in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll get to them uh, in a couple minutes. What we're communicating is if for you to constantly be able to keep up with the markets. You have to make adjustments continuously to yourself and your strategies, right? Options offer such a more diverse way of doing it. Right? Yes. There's yes. so many more ways that you can there's yes. so many tools to mold yourself and work with and mold yep. your strategies compared to other instruments that really do um, you know confine you to certain things. Um, so you know in, in terms of being able to control, you know, risk and reward, Luch, a lot of people understand this. You know, some of the guys who are in here have been to a lot of our stuff, they understand it, but give them, give them a quick rundown of why it's so much easier, you know, to control your, your risk and reward within an option compared to, you know, right. stock and the concept right. of there being no bottom to a stock, you know? 
Right. So controlling your risk to reward with a particular option. Um, let's say let's say you guys are long Twitter right now. Let's just throw it out here, and uh, and and hopefully you know you guys can be able to zoom in here on these charts. Let's say you're trading Twitter, um, and you know you're trying to play. Let's say a move higher. This 38 call. Um, you know, let's say you want to get long this call, right? It's going to cost you 70 cents to get long this call and play this move on Twitter. Now, in the ideal world here, Twitter has to go to 39 or 40 dollars for you to make significant money on this option. Okay, so you're out 70 cents per contract that you buy. Okay, so let's just say you got 100 contracts. That's seven grand that you're going to throw out as an outlay on this on this position. All right, and and you're looking to sell it at a dollar fifty or two dollars, wherever you're looking to sell it at. Now, your downside risk is only is only seven thousand dollars. That's it. If you wanted a hundred contracts represents remember a hundred contract represents ten thousand shares of Twitter. To buy ten thousand shares of Twitter, number one, how much is it going to cost you? Well, she's trading thirty eight bucks to buy ten thousand shares of Twitter. It's going to cost you $38,000, okay? Now, how many of you guys have 38 grand here to just buy 10,000 shares of Twitter? Not a lot of people have that kind of money sitting around, okay, to play that money in the first place. So this is on the reward portion of that whole aspect here, okay? So your bang for your buck just goes a lot further with the options. So just looking at it from that perspective. And by the way, sorry, Geroid has 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 corrected me. So it's not thirty-eight thousand; it's th it's three hundred and eighty grand, okay, to buy ten thousand shares of Twitter. It's four hundred grand. It's damn near half a million bucks, okay, to get exposure to ten thousand shares in Twitter. All right, so that's 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 case number one. Case in point number one, you get much more exposure for the dollars that you have. So your seven thousand dollars has has essentially stretched you to 400 grand here, all right? So that's the first standpoint. And your risk for, honestly, $400,000 in actual exposure is only seven grand. It's only seven grand. So just on that strength of that example alone, there's a lot of value here to using your options. Now, what else could you do here? Well, you could hedge it. You could hedge it. So you could take a look at your options chain. And you could take a look at what Twitter is going for. You could sell calls against this, this option. So you could sell far out of the money calls against this option and create what's known as a spread. So basically, you're going to sell, let's say, an option for 20 cents. And you're going to cut your cost down now to only $5,000 of risk. You know, So instead of the $7,000 of risk, now you only have $5,000 of risk. All right? You could buy puts against it. You know, There's a lot of other things that you could do to help your risk in this particular situation, okay? And again, all those different types of strategies are ones that we teach in our class, but again, this is just a quick example here uh, of how you can get exposure to a lot of, 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 a lot of stock, and you can minimize your risk, uh, uh, you know, uh, very well by using complicated uh, uh, sort of option strategies. And in reality, they're not that complicated, you know? You mess around with a couple of these things once, you're like, aha, you know, that's how this works. So it's very easy to pick up. Right, right. Yeah, guys, so, um, you know, that's that's a very brief explanation. If you have any more questions on this kind of stuff, you can always email us, Lucci at stanlucci.com, or just go to the site, man. There's so much free education on stanlucci.com. Um, I'm going to take nip off a few of the quick questions here, um, or at least one that I see, and then, Lucci, I'll turn them over to you, the ones that probably require a more in-depth answer. Um, Alan Park, you asked, new here, are you guys running a hedge fund? Are your trades on Twitter from your personal account or the hedge fund? Uh, yeah, we are running a hedge fund, Alan. Um, Lucci does not trade any other account besides the one that, um, you know, he's posting the, the P&Ls on for Twitter, right? So what you see on there is the real deal. There's no, um, right. you know, right. no hiding behind multiple. Right, and let's, and, let's, and let's actually preface this because the question here is good risk to reward. And meanwhile, you know, a lot of people on Twitter see me going through a lot of different things. And, and again, it's important for us to reiterate here is that, you know, I trade the way I trade because I am, am looking for outsized returns. I am looking for that big payday. I am looking for an option that's going to go from a dollar to ten dollars. That's what I'm looking for. That's my thing. That's my shtick. You know, that's, that's, that's who I am as a trader. Okay. 
And our example with Nate uh, is a lot different. You know, he understood this information. He took that information and built a different strategy for him completely and took a lot of the risk that I take out of the equation. Okay, but it's important you that you understand how equities move, how options move along with the equity. And it's important that you understand this on a very quick basis so that you can make quick decisions uh, and, and you can also apply your personality, your own style to the situation here. And that way you can find longevity and be able to adapt constantly to, uh, you know, a, a, an increasingly complex market environment. And that's really the takeaway from all this, you know, is that I could sit here and teach you so many different option strategies. I could sit here and teach you about all that kind of stuff. But guess what? 90% of you guys will end up busting your account uh, and giving it up completely. Why? Because you don't understand the, 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 the complex nature of the market. You don't understand, uh, you know, time and sales, bid and ask, the general concepts of what this market is created on right. uh, so that you can, you, can, you can take that information and, and, and look at the market in the way that you need to so that you can constantly adapt and find the money. You can find that money and figure out where, you know, where your place is, uh, you know, in the market amongst all these different participants. Right. I mean, guys, what, what we, we provide is a responsive system, a responsive methodology, right? One that is responsive to change. And it can only be responsive to change as, as quickly as it needs to if you are the one who's in the driver's seat making those changes, right? If you're always waiting for some guru or someone to come around the corner and say, hey, now this is what you need to do, and go do it. A, you're setting yourself up to get crushed by any form of uh, dishonesty right. in the markets. Right. We, you are not, you're, you're, you're not going to be independent, right? And we don't, we don't expect people to come in in the first, you know, three months, six months, or a year, um, go off and, and have this epiphany of who they are, and okay, now I, I understand what Lucci taught me, I understand my personality, and boom, here's my trade, but like, that's where we get to. The guys who are the most successful, who are guys who are in our chat room, a lot of them are in the chat every day still. Um, you know, some of them are, like, like, just like I said about Nate, you know, they're just off doing their own thing right now. They've gotten there because they've taken the understanding that, that Amon has provided them and they've applied it to, to something that makes sense, you know, to them, right? And as we talk about what, what the markets used to be like compared to what they are now, that process of change, it, it's never going to stop. Right. Never. I'm never going to stop. Changing. Never. Never. Uh, regulation, either regulation comes down, screws somebody, money moves here, money moves there, you know, but you can always exist if you can watch that money. If right. you can watch that money, see where it goes, see how it's being made by the players who are still making money, uh, that's, that's you right there. You know, that's you. That's your longevity play. That's your way to adapt to this sort of environment. Right. Um, okay, Dave Cole, you're asking some questions that are, you know, kind of both, um, I think you need to go, go back and check out the, the first webinar that we did, um, you know. Dave I, Cole has a great question, though. He has one great question that I want to make sure I address here. Um, and this is, and th you know what, and this ties back to what we're talking about here. A lot of you guys are asking questions about psychology. Remember, like, that's a mental aspect of the, of the retail game that, <laughs> that we are going to struggle with no matter what. No matter what, like that's going to be the one thing that we struggle with no matter what. All the other players in the game have found a way to take the emotions out of the game by automating their strategy, by going electronic, okay? Market makers, algo traders, even retail guys who build their own algorithms because they can't stand dealing with the mental aspect of the game. So for any retail guy here that's asking psychological questions, uh, you know, this, this webinar is focused more on the adaptability here. And remember, with psychology, you have to constantly be at it. So you have to constantly adapt. You have to constantly watch uh, your mental game, your mental, your sort of thought process, and keep reinventing yourself. And that's kind of what I'm going through right now. All right? Dave Cole has a great question, though, and it speaks to what we're talking about here. Not accounting for time decay. How nearly close, closely priced are options compared to the underlying equity? Can the two be arbitraged? Okay? So what I want to ask you right now, and this question goes to Dave Cole, but since Dave Cole asked this question, 
I'm sure a lot of you guys are thinking about it as well, right? He's asking, is, is there any arbitrage between sort of the validity of my options price, okay? And think about how intelligent people have come. And when I say people, I mean algo traders, HFT guys, who literally study this for a living. Dave Cole, I am asking you, do you think there is any edge or arbitrage left in a world where people are as smart as they are now and build systems to trade the markets as they are now? Do you think there's any arbitrage left, my friend? Do you think, do you think your retail goofy ass has come up with a way, has come up with an arbitrage situation that, that smarter players, guys with more access to data, don't already know about, my friend? That's my point. That is my point, right? So you got retail coming in here thinking there's this arbitrage, right? Thinking there's this edge here. Why are options priced the way they are? Most retail doesn't even understand why an option is priced the way it is, you know? And these are also the fundamental understanding of the market of options pricing that you need if you're going to adapt and stay relevant in a market where everybody else is 10 times smarter than you, is 10 times smarter than you. They've already juiced all the arbitrage that you can possibly imagine, okay? And in we come trying to find our peace, okay? So the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you understand the market from a fundamental level understand the always changing aspect of it and realizing where that sort of big big picture money is all right so so that question pertains to you know everything that we're talking about here so thank you Dave for asking that question it's yeah. important that retail understands that anything that you could possibly think of as far as arbitrage in the US equity market and now the option space has been thought about has been exploited has been researched to the nth degree by people, by PhD chemists from every single top college in the nation. There's papers being write, uh, written on this. There are, 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 are people getting paid top dollars, top dollars to offer advice to HFT firms that, so that they can make this money far faster than we can. Oh my God, I can keep going on forever about how dumb everybody in this room is and how dumb I am, okay? I can go right. on forever, but right. that's not what I want to do here. What I right. want to do is show you a world where the understanding of how these things are move, how the markets move, how, how the markets constantly flow and change, uh, and how you can adapt to it, and the, the need for you to constantly adapt to it. Right, and, you know, there's, I mean, what, what I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Lish, but, you know, what, essentially what, I, what you're saying is, you're not, you know, you can't go about this trying to beat them at their own game. Right? You exactly. can't out-strategize them, right? Exactly. You, you have to find the way, you know, your only edge is to really, truly get the approach that makes the most sense to you, right? Because trust me, there's plenty of guys who are not geniuses who make tons of money in the markets right now, right? You don't have to have an IQ. Lucci's not saying you have to have an IQ over 200 to even no. sit down and, and, and trade the markets now. What he's saying is... If, if you want to be intelligent about going, you know, into the markets now, do it. Do it in a way that it's not just, you know, okay, I'm going to study more ways to to put on an options trade. Um, it's I'm going to study the ways that you know the markets actually make sense to me. The strategy right. makes sense to me because if you're trading exactly. something that doesn't actually make sense to you, you're you are you have no chance, right? I mean, you're yeah. you're, you're screwed. Right. Um, so we had a couple of questions about the, the trade, the Netflix trade, you know, on Friday. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to hop into that, Luch, and, and give people a rundown of kind of... I mean, not really time and place. I mean, we could do a separate webinar on it. I will just say uh, with the Netflix trade, there was a lot of psychological issues wrapped up in that trade versus anything risk to reward related or anything like that. It was a, it was a shot that I took. I was up 160 grand in it. Didn't take it. Thought it was the move, and it turned out to be a miss. And you know, ended up ended up getting burned for a loss. So, you know, these are one of those things where you know, you 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 trade your strategy. You trade what you see. Sometimes you're going to be right. Sometimes you're going to be wrong. So that's the sort of 
statistical nature of the markets that you have to deal with here. You know, right. So that's, that's kind of what's, what happened there. Right. And, you know, guys, no one is sitting here saying, you know, that they're, they're, they're perfect. Um, and what Lucci has, has explained multiple times in the webinar is like, he puts on this, man. That's his style. That's, that's and, it. And, you know, yep. that's, there, there are consequences, you know, for that. And it's, it's nothing, new, nothing new to him. You know, that's not to say that um, we, we take everyone who's coming into the, the classes and whatnot and say, you know, hey, if you're not willing to put on, um, you know, X percent of your account, then get out of here, right? If anything, right. It's, it's the right. opposite. We really encourage people to uh, right. be more right. conservative, especially when they start out. Right. And, and again, the whole idea and premise here, um, you know, we'll probably take a couple more questions, but the whole idea and premise here is to give you the understanding of how options move from a common sense approach so that you can look at your option chain, you can look at your level twos, you can look at your options prices and say, yeah, you know what, there's game here, I'm going to get involved here, and I'm going to say no to X, Y, and Z trade. So it's about you making better decisions. It's about you adapting to a, an environment which changes very quickly now, um, and you really have to stay ahead of the curve, and you have to find the money very quickly, uh, and you have to be able to adapt. You know, people that get stuck with that whole complacent um, way of going about things, those are the ones that eventually get swallowed up. The natural order of capitalistic systems, they end up swallowing the players who just don't get it and cannot adapt. And they feed the ones who can. That's it. That's it. That's all. That's all. It, that's all. That's all, all. You know, all of these systems were built on. Like that is the premise that all of these systems work with. Right. So you either adapt or you get swallowed up. Right. So who do you want to be? Who you want to be? Who do you want to be? And you know, um, I, guys, we can take a couple more. I think we we'll probably take one more question because we're getting we're getting a little bit long. Um, yeah. But before you bounce. We have a very cool webinar coming up on Thursday, right? This is going to be at 4.30. We're going to replace the mailbag with this one, um, and we'll do the mailbag on Friday. And Fred Gamba, a lot of you guys know what he's been writing for the site. He's gotten tons of positive feedback. He's a newer trader, also, but also a, a, you know, a, an options trader with a lot of potential, um, similar in, in mindset and sometimes temperament to, to Anon, you know, and stepping to learn underneath his wing. He's going to sit down with Lucci and, and ask him a lot of questions. Um, just about, you know, these are the things that, like, that, that Greg really wants, you know, to know. And it's not to say that Greg can't have these quite, these, these conversations with, with Anon sometimes, you know, working with us now. But we're obscenely busy, guys. Like, you would actually yeah. know at how infrequently it is that Greg gets the opportunity to sit down with Lucci and pick his brain about stuff, right? So, in a way, this is sort of like these two guys having, having a conversation that they haven't had, you know, in, in a long time, and we're publicizing it for your guys' benefit, right? So yeah, yeah, out. and yeah, and by the way, like Greg and I have an interesting dynamic. During the workday, we are at each other's throats all the time. I can't freaking stand him sometimes, and he can't stand me. So right. it's going to make for a a very entertaining experience. I will say that. Right, right. Okay. Um, last piece here, or last question here before we before we bounce. Um, you know, I think Luch. Francisco asked the question, so what is your edge, right? What is your edge? And we've obviously right. hit on your edge is understanding yourself. And My edge is in understanding myself and understanding understanding options and the markets from a fundamental level. And when I say fundamental, I mean a level that is the only true all, be all aspect of the market. And that is tape. That right. is supply and demand. That is buyer, you got a buyer and you got a seller. Who's bigger? Whoever wins, that's where the stock goes. That is purely, it's simple supply and demand mechanics that the market has been, has, was built on from the first place. All right. it is is different players involved. Now you just have to adapt to reading the different players. That's it. When you understand a market from that level, you will always be able to adapt. If you come into the market with your technicals and your little gadgets and gadgets, those things will soon not work, and you have no strategy. And you have to come up with new gadgets and gadgets, so therefore you'll end up buying into all kinds of programs online with new gadgets and gadgets, which eventually, those aren't going to work eventually. Too. You right. know, that's, that's, that's it. That's it. Right. So, guys, if you've got questions, um, hit us up. If you've got questions going in the next one, if we didn't get to your question, you can either email us, luchitsangluchit.com, or you can just join us in the, in the webinar on 430. Um, on Thursday, Greg's going to be interviewing Lucci. It's going to be a good one. 
Um, you know, he's, he's coming from a, a trader's perspective that is thirstier to learn than you guys, yeah. more thirsty is probably the way to put it, than you guys can even imagine, right? This kid is eating leaves and lives and breathes and stuff. So, um, right. And, and another thing too, you know, for those of you guys who don't know, we, we have, you know, he has taken now, uh, you started again with a $5,000 account uh, and he is trying to grow that $5,000 account. He is posting P&Ls just like myself uh, right. on Twitter for everybody to see. So that way you guys who have much smaller accounts uh, who maybe think you can't relate to somebody like myself who is trading a seven-figure account, um, you know, that's that's your sort of uh, uh, relation here to the Sanguchi world. Uh, and remember, I started with five grand too. Um, so you know, I'm, I, I, I I've gone I've gone through everything that he's gone through as well. Uh, so everybody who's looking for him on Twitter, uh, you can find him at Options Trader NJ on Twitter. Awesome. Okay. All right, guys. Well, thank you for joining. Thank you for asking good questions. As always. We will see you Thursday. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, people are asking again. His name is Greg Gamba, right? I'll, I'll put this yep. in. Greg Gamba. Uh, yeah, Charlie will throw it out on the um, on the question box, so everybody should check it out. And and make sure you register, guys, for that webinar. We'll have the link up on Twitter very shortly. Uh, that way, you can register and get your spot. We only have 100 seats, so um, you know, definitely get in there as soon as possible. All right, everybody. All right, guys. Thanks for joining. Take care.